Welcome to Castle Rising in Norfolk. I have just been doing a sketch of this beautiful old building in front of me. It used to be an old schoolhouse, but today it's a studio used by painters from all over England. It's a beautiful building from a watercolour's point of view because it has all the characteristics that we need for watercolour painting. Just look at the pan tiles on the roofs and that old red brickwork. It's fantastic. Now we're not going to paint this scene right away. First of all, I want to take you inside and show you the basic techniques that you need to paint a watercolour like this. So let's go. Well, now I'm back inside the studio and I must say it's a lot warmer in here and I have the sketch completed. But first of all, I want you to take a look at the sketch and I'll explain a few things about sketching to you. You can see that we have a natural horizon line in most paintings. And then if we put a building into the landscape, that building has vertical lines that connect it from the ground to the roof. Now, any line that is above the horizon must run towards the vanishing point. Now, this is a, a word that confuses a lot of people. But all that means is that as a building recedes, it gets smaller. So a line above the horizon is falling, a line below the horizon is rising. Because the wall that is back here is going to be smaller than the wall that's closest to us. Now in reality, they're probably both the same size, but it looks smaller. In the same way, any line above the horizon that's going away on this side is falling, any line below the horizon that's going away on that side is falling. So we have the same thing happening here. Now, if we put a roof on the building, there's a gable end wall. And the same thing there, that's the far gable. This line along the ridge tile is falling as well. So we can see lines above the horizon falling, lines below the horizon rising. If we put doors into the building, there's one door. That's the width of it. There's the width of the window. But again, the top of the door is following the line of the fall of the roof. Top of the window, exactly the same. If we cross the horizon line, which is this one, then the line must start to rise. So there's our door and our window. And that's the simple message of perspective. As things recede, they get smaller. As long as we bear that in the back of our mind, we don't have to concentrate too much on all the complications that arise out of perspective. You can see in the building that I've sketched, we have rising lines below the horizon, falling lines above the horizon. And that's all we need to bear in mind. So let's get in now and mix a few paints for the painting itself. So filling the tray with water, I'm going to fill a couple of trays. And we'll start with the cloud color. That's the sunlit cloud. And I'm going to use raw sienna and water. Now that's a very, very pale wash of raw sienna and water. A pale wash just means that we use a lot more water. The next color is going to be ultramarine blue. We put that in first of all. Now we need quite a bit of this blue to give us the blue of the sky. Just mixing that through. Always make sure that the brush is well mixed through the paint so that you take all the pigment out of the hairs of the brush and you don't have little bits of paint sticking to the paper whenever you start to paint. I'm going to kill the blue slightly with a little bit of light red and only a touch of light red, not an awful lot at all, just to take the edge and the strength off the blue mixing all the pigment through. Now, the third wash that I'm going to mix in this tray is crimson, which is this deep, dark red. There's still blue in the brush, so it's going to give me a very pale, purplish color. And we can start to put on the sunlit sky. You can put that raw sienna color along the top of the house. Now, we have to be very careful that we don't actually bring the color down over the house itself. We leave some white above the house so that we can give the impression of white clouds popping up in the background. Now I'm going into the cloud shadow colour and I'm going to put some of this on. Look at that lovely purplish colour. And that's cloud shadows but they're not too dark. We don't want them too dark today because the sky is quite light. 
And when you have a very fussy painting below, try and make the sky very simple so that it's not competing with the buildings in the foreground. Now the blue sky, this is ultramarine and light red, and this is coming along the top and merging with the paint, leaving some white areas for cloud. And just watching the runs. Just putting some blue along here, filling in the top area of the sky. Now cut along the top of the house there, a nice neat line, filling in the corners, and the same here behind the tree. Now always think of the shape of the clouds. You have to keep in mind that the clouds are blowing across the sky. That's enough paint, I'm just gonna blend that out now using a little bit of water, softening out some of the edges. And as I said, we don't want it too fussy at all. Down along the chimney, across the top of the roof. Cutting around the areas that we want to retain light color. And softening all the time. This has to be done pretty quickly. And there we start to get the outline of the buildings. Now this is a three quarter inch flat brush and it can be used very neatly around the buildings, although it is a big brush, just by using the edge of the hair of the brush to cut neatly around the top. And a bit more water just to soften this area. We can bring that right down behind the trees in the background because they're going to be slightly darker just to fill in that whole area. Another little bit. And then we just let that dry. Now while we're waiting on that wash to dry, we can take a look at the color that we're going to use for the distant trees behind the house, which is the next stage of the painting. And that color is a mixture of light red and ultramarine. Not so much light red and more ultramarine to give us a purplish blue. Now, I'm going to come up to the paper again, and I have a border on the side, and I'll show you what that wash looks like. It's a dark purplish blue, and whenever we put it in with the side of the brush, we can give a broken top and a broken outline to give us the shape of the tops of trees. And that's going to go into this area here. Because if you look in the distant background behind the, tree, behind the house, we have a, a bank of trees but we want to throw that back, that's not important. And we don't want to put a lot of detail into that so it starts to compete with the detail in the building. So we just blew it and throw it back into the distance. So even though this is still a little bit wet, I'm gonna put that in because you'll see that when I put it in to the drying wash, we get a soft top to it. And that's gonna give me a nice effect of background trees with indefinite tops and we cut along the big tree to the right hand side. And there's another top of a tree there. They're not all the same shape or the same height, but it's very important that we cut around the edge of the building so that we give a nice clean edge to it. Now, there's a bank of fir trees just below those distant trees, and that's a mixture of Windsor yellow and Windsor blue, and that'll give us a dark green. Just to give it an earthiness, we're gonna add a little bit of light red. Now I'm going back up to feed this into the wash that I've just put on, and you can see that it is a definite bluish green. Now you'll find that fir trees do have a blueness to them that other trees don't have. Now giving a broken top, and cutting along the edge of the tree. If we happen to go over the tree, then the subsequent wash that we put on for the tree will show the darker wash through it because watercolor is a transparent medium. So we must be very careful and plan what we're going to do. Coming down the side of the house, now there's a little bush here at the bottom. I want to leave that clear at this stage because it's lighter than the trees behind it. 
and cutting along the top of the wall, still using the three quarter inch brush because we can cover a lot of area with that brush. There we are, that's our fir trees in. Now you can see that the different strengths of paint is giving the feeling of texture to those trees. And that's very important that we always show texture. If we put on flat washes, the whole painting is going to look flat and it doesn't have any impact. So we must always try and put a bit of texture in there. And as long as a wash is wet, we can bleed other colors into it. 